And here we have speaking um, from the Basque Culinary Center, John Regafalk, who is the um, who is the head of research. Yes, let's welcome him. Can I get that right? Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to say thank you to the organization, of course, for inviting me. Um, and also thank you uh, to all the colleagues and all other fans of gastronomy that we have here today. Thank you for coming and giving me a little bit of your, of your time. So, um, and thank you, Darren, for doing that perfect introduction of the Basque Culinary Center. Um, let's see if I can manage this one. The other way around, right? That's the way. Um, so, actually, uh, the different areas, I think the Basque Culinary Center is most well known for the university part. So, we're the Faculty of Gastronomic Sciences of Mondragon University. Um, and in that part, we have both a bachelor's degree, we have different master's programs, and we also have a PhD program in gastronomy, which is uh, quite something quite groundbreaking in this, in this area. Um, I split my time between teaching at the, at the bachelor's degree. I teach avant-garde techniques uh, in the kitchen. And I also do research, so I'm a research chef and I do research and innovation in what is called BCC Innovation, which is the research center. So that's a little bit, I have a split role there uh, when it comes to both teaching and of course uh, generating new knowledge as well to later be transmitted to, to our students. So um, it's really nice to be here today to talk to you about as Darren said, a little bit an, a nerdy topic, maybe. A uh, very technical one, for sure. Uh, but I think it's a very intriguing intersection between uh, science and culinary arts. And we'll be talking about enzymes today. So, uh, this presentation aims to take you a little bit on a really, really short exploratory trip into this uh, world of enzymes. Uh, and I want to explain to you a little bit about these microscopic molecules that can uh, kind of open up a new universe for us as chefs in the kitchen as well. Uh, ways to transform food, uh, novel ways to transform food that we might not have encountered uh, before. And I would say it's, there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of new possibilities in the kitchen around this around this topic, right? So I think as culinary professionals, we're always kind of looking for that, you know, new innovation or to create that new uh, great dish or find that new technique that we're, uh, that's groundbreaking that we can do something new with. So uh, I think, I do believe that enzymes could be one of these secret ingredients or, or new techniques. Um, so I hope I can demystify a little bit what enzymes are. I'm sure it's a word you've heard a lot about before, but maybe not the real science behind it. So, um, I mean, these quite fascinating biological molecules can help us transform textures, unlock flavors, and, and really uh, create a lot of uh, new interesting stuff that maybe traditional cooking techniques can't really do at the same level. So, simply put, enzymes are proteins. They're proteins with a three-dimensional structure which uh, allows them to work as biological catalysts. And what does this mean then? It means that they can provoke or, or speed up chemical reactions in our food, because today we're talking about food, uh, that would otherwise take really long for them to occur naturally. Um, just imagine a huge block of ice here on stage, right? And I need to melt it. Um, of course, I could just leave it there in room temperature for a while and it, it will eventually melt. But that might take days if we're talking about a huge block of ice. So now imagine just going at it with blow torches or hair dryers or whatever you want to imagine. And that's basically what enzymes can do in our cooking. They can speed up the processes 
exponentially. So we can we can manage things that we could not do in a in a in a, a certain time frame otherwise, right? So um, these are of course invisible. We're talking mil molecules. They're invisible little helpers that can either help us digest food in our digestive system, or they can help turn uh, starches into sugars and then trigger fermentations. So there's a lot of things that enzymes are responsible for that we might not think about in, uh, in our everyday. Picture a simple loaf of bread. So a loaf of bread made with yeast, of course, um, but that yeast isn't really on its own capable of fermenting the flour in a, in a bread dough. It, need help. it needs help from enzymes. And the, the yeast itself will generate these enzymes to break down the starches in the flour into sugars that can then fuel the fermentation. And that's, of course, what gives the rice to our bread. That's what unlocks the flavors in our breads as well. So um, those are really like enzymes are really responsible for the basis of fermentation in that sense. And while our ancestors, of course, uh, utilized this sort of, uh, uh, they leveraged enzymes through fermentation processes, but they did it unknowingly. I would say that today we have the scientific knowledge to to direct these uh, these enzymatic processes in a scientific way, because we we have studied it and we know what's what's happening behind the scenes, so to say. So enzymes are like really enzymes are omnipresent; they're everywhere in nature, in our lives. Um, and I think it's really important to recognize that enzymes are not aliens. They are a natural thing existing everywhere. Uh, and I mean, they can do anything like, as we said, break down flour into to sugars, tenderize meat, ferment beverages, enhance flavors. Um, we took the bread as an example before. We have enzymes in the bread dough, uh, but also in other products in our everyday life. Um, pineapple, papaya, they're examples of fruit that have a lot of enzymes in them. Cheese is another, is another example. And cheese is interesting because uh, enzymes actually serves a, a, a dual function within cheese. So I'm sure you all know how to make cheese. Uh, let's consider this enzyme called rennet. Rennet is what actually coagulates the milk, right? And it's the first step to making a cheese. So uh, the rennet is uh, extracted from the stomach uh, of ruminant anim animals. Uh, so that's where we get the enzyme from. We combine it with the milk, we coagulate the milk, we separate the curds from the whey, basic cheese making process. So up until here, we've used one of the enzymes. But also, as the cheese ages, uh, other enzymes will go to work on this, on this mass of curds, right? So, uh, enzymes that are uh, native to the milk or enzymes that are being generated all the time by the fermenting microorganisms in the cheese will break down uh, complex molecules like proteins, uh, like the fats, in the milk as well, and it will break it down to generate new flavors, new aromas, and also change the texture. So if we think about a, a final cheese, it could be a camembert, it could be a, a, a gruyere, a parmesan, all these cheeses uh, have had an enzymatic process generating all these flavors and the final texture. So that's another very, very common uh, example of uh, enzymes in our in our everyday lives, right? A little bit more. We were talking about bread before, day-to-day -day encounters with with enzymes. So let's focus a little bit more on that. Um, let's consider that we in our saliva have a lot of amylase enzymes. So amylase enzymes are the ones that break down starch into sugars. 
as soon as we take a bite out of a, a piece of bread uh, and we start chewing it, these amylase enzymes will start mixing with the, with the starch in the bread. So if we keep, if we keep masticating, we, we chew um, the bread a little bit, we keep it in our mouth, it will, it will start tasting sweet almost instantly. After a few seconds, it will already start tasting sweet. And that's the amylase enzymes going to work on the starches, breaking them down into sugars. And this is a really, really fast uh, process. The same thing uh, happens in brewing. When we want to brew beer, we use the native enzymes from the barley. They will break down the starches in the barley into sugars, which will then, of course, fuel the fermentation process once we get the yeasts in there as well. So uh, this enzymatic conversion of starches into sugars is uh, really important, not only for the alcohol yield of a beer, but also for the final, both texture and flavor, actually. So let's do a quick deep dive into, into the real science behind, behind the enzymes, right? Let's see. It's a little bit tricky, this one, huh? There you go. So each enzyme, when we talk about different enzymes, I mean, we have proteases, amylases, pectinases, cellulases, there are so many. Usually they all, they all finish with ACE. Um, and each one of these enzymes are highly specific and will work on only one type of substrate. It's a little bit like a lock and key. Um, we can think about it as a, as a lock and key kind of mechanism that the enzyme uh, will only fit one type of substrate. In this, in this example, the substrate is sugar. So it's a, very, it's, a, it's a carbohydrate, right? But that could be starch, it could be a fat, it could be a protein. But each one of the enzymes will only fit with that exact substrate. So, so what we need to talk about is the specificity of enzymes and understand that they won't work on anything else. So that's why we need to have the knowledge behind the enzymes and behind the science uh, that manages this whole process, right? Uh, to understand, to tailor uh, each enzyme to a certain process that we want, to, we want to happen. So we talk about lipases, they will break down fats or lipids. Proteases will break down uh, proteins. Um, amylases, as we said before, will break down starches into sugars. So it's really important to choose the right enzyme for the, for the job, because otherwise nothing will happen, basically. So the, and that's, that's the way we can precisely manipulate textures, flavors, or even change the nutritional profile of our food thanks to enzymes. So enzymes are really not, uh, as you can understand from this lock and key mechanisms, um, enzymes are not a, a one-size-fits-all solution. So we, that's why we really need to understand. Um, and we also need to understand the optimal conditions for each one of the enzymes because they're all uh, different. And the optimal con condition is where the enzymes arrange, where the enzyme will uh, work the most efficiently. So we're, can, we're talking about factors like temperature, like pH, salinity, uh, and many other things that will condition the way the enzyme works. So, uh, for example, as the bread example before, right? We make a bread dough. A bread dough will rise much faster in a warm room than in a cold room. Basic. Uh, we all know that. But why? Because the enzymes will work harder and faster in a, warm, in, a, in a warm room than in a cold room, and they will feed the yeast faster. Um, other, other enzymes like pepsin, for example, also used in cheese making, uh, really needs acidic conditions to be able to function properly. So we need to know this when we apply the enzymes in our, uh, in our kitchens, right? In our uh, different innovations that we want to do in our, uh, in our kitchens. So a little bit understanding these nuances of 
how Enzyme works. It's a little bit like knowing the settings of, uh, of our kitchen app. It's a little bit tricky, this one. Yeah, there we go. So enzyme denaturation is also a very, uh, it's a key word here. We need to understand when we are killing the enzymes, so to say. Uh, enzymes are proteins, as we said before. So, of course, there are moments uh, when this uh, three-dimensional structure will become disrupted, and that will inactivate uh, our enzymes. So... This can occur uh, because of external factors like high temperature, uh, extreme pHs, or even uh, agents like alcohol can denature uh, our enzymes. Uh, and a lot of times we do this uh, willingly, and we, for example, we raise the temperature when we've finished an enzymatic process, we raise the temperature of whatever we're doing up till pasteurization temperatures, and that means killing off all the enzymatic activity. So this is something that we can do because we want to stop the enzymatic activity. When we were talking about optimal conditions before, we need to understand in which range uh, will the enzymes work. And in this case, we need to understand what, at what temperature will we actually stop the activity. And since enzymes are really sensitive to uh, temperature swings or different uh, temperatures, we can also lower the activity by cooling down our, uh, the thing that we are, we are doing with enzymes. So we just cool it down, we lower the temperature, and everything will happen much slower, much like the, the bread dough from before. So... Um, of course, enzymes uh, is not is not limited to one one cuisine or to one one type of culture or or one one culture around the world. It's really a global tradition. It, it's found everywhere, and we've always used them. But as I said before, uh, most of the time unknowingly, actually. So I mean, if we're talking about Japanese tradition of miso, of sake, or amasake, or we're talking about African uh, alcoholic beverages that uses amylase to to convert that starch into into sugars and then into alcohol. I think we need to understand that enzymes, in the end, is a very universal uh, culinary language that is spoken around the world. And I think that knowing more about enzymes can actually enrich the cultures in our kitchens as well, and especially our our toolbox of techniques. That we, that we can use in the kitchen. So every, every cuisine, as I said, uh, around the world uses enzymes somehow, some way, uh, and, and each cuisine has their own take on what I would call enzymatic cooking, whether, it, uh, whether it's uh, the marination process of, 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 of using pineapple juice to marinate meats, in the Americas, or uh, the fermentation process of kimchi in, in Korea, or even fermenting vegetables with leftover whey, as we do a lot in the Nordic countries in, uh, in Europe. Um, and I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's useful to know it, and I think we can have a lot of interesting interchange uh, between different cultures, and, and kind of connect culinary bridges by using uh, enzymes in a way that may be used in another culture uh, and use it with our local ingredients, much like we've been using fermentation over the last years, looking for techniques from around the world, but applying, the, uh, applying those techniques to, to more to local ingredients, right? This is a pretty interesting uh, drink, actually. It's called chicha. Uh, so chicha is a fermented corn drink from South America. And alongside other drinks uh, from Africa, from the Nordic countries as well, um, it's, it traditionally used a very, uh, a very particular technique to get the fermentation going, to get the fermentation started. So uh, the raw material for the drink was actually chewed, chewed for a while, and then spat out 
into a fermentation vessel. And this uh, mixed, of course, the starches in the main ingredients, in this, in this case corn or maize, uh, with the amylases from our saliva. And that was what started the conversion of starch into sugars that would then kickstart the fermentation process. So, of course, this was the traditional way of, of, of doing it. Nowadays, we don't really use the same technique. Um, but I think it really highlights uh, how those ingenious ways that our ancestors uh, were using enzymatic processes uh, to craft beverages, in this case, uh, unknowingly, as I was talking about before, right? Uh, koji which I'm, I'm sure you all know of, uh, ancient, very well-known uh, Asian, especially Japanese uh, ingredient. And, and koji is jam-packed with enzymes. When we make koji, it's actually, and it's not for its flavor, it's not for uh, utilizing rice in a certain way, it's actually because we want the enzymes. What we are after are the enzymes that are created inside the koji. And there's a variety of different uh, enzymes. And in this, in this example here, these enzymes can be our white knight to transform uh, some sort of leftovers into a, into a new product, right? So by, by utilizing the proteases created inside the koji, uh, we can actually seamlessly break down uh, fish leftovers into a luscious and umami-rich fish sauce. So, uh, koji in, in that sense is very, very versatile. It has a lot of different enzymes. It creates both amylases, proteases, lipases, and a lot more uh, enzymes. So, it's, uh, it's a wide, wide range, uh, really, of enzymes that we can get out of uh, a koji in a, uh, in a traditional uh, way of making it. And I think it's, it's a great example of how we can uh, we can extract profound flavors from very, very humble ingredients, like fish leftovers in this, in this case. So in, in contemporary gastronomy, I think we, th we see enzymes, uh, also commercial enzymes. With commercial enzymes, I mean purified enzymes that are sold as a purified uh, one single enzyme instead uh, instead of talking about the koji, f uh, for example, that has a range of different enzymes in it. So we see em enzymes employed in novel ways in contemporary cooking. Uh, and, and it also allows us for very creative applications. So just as an example, transglutaminase, I'm so sure you've heard of it before, also called meat glue, uh, which has the capacity to bind proteins together in a very interesting way. Um, and so enzymes have, I would say, transitioned from what we saw before, maybe a koji application with a variety, wide variety of different enzymes to more uh, innovative applications that really push the boundaries of, of what we're able to do and to create and to transform uh, in our kitchens. So we're basically talking about kind of custom designing a cooking process, but at a molecular level. There we go. So um, I would say in a professional kitchen, of course, uh, tools are as important as ingredients. Tools and uh, tools and, and culinary processes, culinary techniques, um, and I believe that enzymes will become one of the most potent tools uh, in the future. I mean, we are still just in the beginning of seeing enzymes being deployed in the kitchen, especially commercial enzymes. Um, so we're going a little bit from uh, it's it's not about abstract concepts confined to a food science lab anymore. They're actually, uh, enzymes can actually be practical solutions uh, to create, to innovate, to reduce waste, to save time, or even maybe even solve some of those culinary challenges that has 
uh, puzzled chefs for years or for, for centuries, right? But of course, like any tool, I would say that enzymes require uh, also a lot of practice, a lot of study, of course, you need to understand uh, the science behind it, um, practice and a little bit of ingenuity as well. So, of course, as chefs, one of our main reasons or one of our primary goals, I would say, is always to, um, to delight the senses. And I think that enzymes could actually offer new ways of delighting the senses of, of, of our clients um, in new interesting ways. As we said before, we can tenderize meats, we can intensi intensify flavors of... Uh, of our products, of, of fruits, we can craft dairy-free cheeses that can even rival their, uh, the original uh, cheese that you're comparing it with. So it's a little bit like discovering a new ingredient, a new secret ingredient that you, you never even heard about before, right? So, um, but I will say more than just the wow factor, uh, the application of enzymes can also be uh, targeted towards nutrition and towards sustainability, of course. So, um, proteases, they're a group of, uh, of enzymes that target proteins, as we said before. Is it, is it loading? Okay. So, um, as I said, proteases, they're uh, a group of enzymes. They catalyze the breakdown of proteins into smaller molecules like peptides and amino acids. Uh, and when applied correctly, uh, proteases can speed up the process of making a traditional garum, which I'm so sure you know, it's a, it's a fish sauce, a very, very umami-rich fish sauce. It could speed up this process um, in, and, and we can look at hours instead of months for making the final product. And this is with the help of, of these enzymes. So once we know how to, as we, we talked about before, we, once we know the optimal conditions, we know which type of enzyme to use, because not all of, them, all of the enzymes are made the same way. For example, for making, for making um, uh, we can use for tenderizing meat, we can use pineapple, we can use papaya. But if we would use pineapple or papaya enzymes to make something like this, uh, a fish sauce, a garum, we would end up with a very bitter end result. But if we know which enzyme to choose exactly, maybe from the commercial side of the enzymes, we can actually uh, speed up this process and avoid that bitterness. So this is, um, this is a time lapse that we made over 48 hours of creating this garum instead of what would have normally taken two to three months. Look, can we start that video, please? It's a very short video. It's just a few seconds, but... Oh, nothing? Video of this process, 48 hours to make the final uh, garum instead of the normal two to three months. So it's, a, it's definitely a way to, to speed up. I would say one of the most rewarding uh, aspects of using enzymes in the kitchen, at least for me, is the potential for sustainability. So we've been working a lot with waste reduction in the Basque Culinary Center. And in this case, we have stale bread. We've been working a lot with upcycling of stale bread. And through the use of enzymes, amylases, as we were talking about before, they break the starches down into sugars, we can create a type of uh, glucose-rich sugary syrup, which is mu much like a malt syrup or a, or a golden syrup. So this can, of course, be very ver versatile. Afterwards, we can use it for sweetening, sweetening baked goods or even making cocktails or... Uh, enriching sauces, whatever we want to use it for. So breaking down co complex carbohydrates into sugars, which has a lot of value, is one of the upcycling options. 
I would say it's a win-win situation. Another interesting project we were working on um, was started when we noticed the sheer amount of orange peels that we get out of our cafeteria in the university each single day. So we're talking kilos and kilos. So uh, when we recognized this as a problem, uh, we started investigating a little bit and we were inspired to actually uh, put together a doctoral thesis on this subject. So one of our PhD candidates, she took on this challenge and started uh, working her thesis on upcycling of uh, these orange peels. So um, turning something into what, what had been waste for each day for a very, very long time, turning that into something, uh, actually turning it in, into a field of academic research was something quite new. So what we did was, uh, with the enzymatic application, we, could, we can break down the, the physical structure of the peel, we can also mitigate all the bitterness from the peel, and then we can start incorporating it into new products. So that's giving it new, uh, new culinary value, right? Here we have an example, our Madeleines, that we uh, incorporated 30% of orange peel into the formulation, into the recipe. Uh, and also a freeze-dried little uh, chocolate-covered orange snack, which maintains all the aromatic uh, properties of the orange peels, um, but in a, in a chocolate-covered snack version. So that's some of the, um, some of the ways that we can upcycle uh, the, different, uh, the different waste products or that would normally be thrown out. A few, a few more examples from our, uh, from our classes, actually. Uh, when we give, give classes to our students uh, on enzymes, this is a dish, very traditional uh, Italian dish, cacio e pepe. It's uh, pasta, with, uh, normally with uh, a sheep's cheese called uh, pecorino romano and black pepper. In this case, we've done uh, a very fast process of changing the, the aromatic properties of milk into a very similar uh, product on an aromatic level, very similar to the cheese, but after only two hours. So in two hours we can create something that resembles uh, Pecorino Romano, which normally has six or eight months of maturation. And then we create uh, we replicate a kind of uh, a very standard, very uh, well-known Italian dish with this uh, with this uh, milk, fresh, fresh milk cheese, so to say. Uh, we were talking about transglutaminase before, or meat glue. Um, we've seen chefs using it for for. Uh, binding together salmon with cuts of meat or binding sm smaller cuts of meat together to make a homogeneous steak. But we can also use transglutaminase for uh, binding together uh, plant-based proteins. So what we've done here is a terrine of uh, pea and soy proteins, um, much like a normal terrine uh, made from meat. But in this case, we've needed to use transglut transglutaminase to to get it all together. And then it's seasoned with pimenton de la vera, which is the typical, the smoked paprika from Spain. And on the side, we have a, 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 an amino paste made from exactly the same, the same complex, the same protein mix of pea and soy. But in that case, we've broken the proteins down into um, amino acids, very tasty amino acids, uh, and made this, this tasty paste on the side. So, that is uh, a little bit different, different ways of using more than one enzyme in, in one dish. Yep. And the last example here, um, impossible banana. One of the dishes I think is very interesting as well because we use the whole product. Um, so enzymes really gives us that opportunity to, to enjoy and, and, and use the whole product in something that we normally throw away the peel from the banana, right? Very few of us, I think, actually use the banana peel. So peels are usually discarded, but we, through the, uh, through the action of enzymes, can actually use 
uh, pectinase and cellulase to use the peel, break down the fibrous structure of the peel and incorporate it into the dish. So we have three different uh, parts of this dish. We have the crystal clear banana juice, which is clarified with pectinase as well. So it's an uh, enzyme clarification. And then we have a toffee made from the leftover pulp from the clarification process. And then we use the peels to make a souffle, which is what you see in the center of the plate. So breaking down, down those peels and extracting both flavor and nutrients something that would normally end up uh, thrown away otherwise. So this is just a few of the applications we've been using, uh, we've been working on at the Basque Culinary Center for these uh, last years, four or five years we've been working on, on, on enzymes. And I do think, I do believe that uh, it can really help us. It can be a, one of those new techniques or new interesting tools to use in our kitchens as well. And um, just to say, I hope you, you've learned something new here today. I know it's a lot of uh, technical aspects and it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's a very technical and maybe a little bit nerdy, as Darren said before. But uh, little by little, I think we can go incorporating uh, enzymes into our toolbox of techniques in our, in our restaurants' kitchens. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for allowing us to geek out a little bit. Um, maybe we have like time for one or two questions, but like very quick ones. And I think we've got quite a few. We'll take like the first two. Um, can you talk a little bit about the rise of gluten intolerance and other food-related intolerances and the role that enzymes might come to play in this? So there are uh, processes uh, with enzymes to break down, in, in, especially in the case of gluten, to break down the protein, which, which is the gluten, into smaller pieces that are no longer allergenic. So it's, that's, a, that's a process that is already used a lot in the food industry. Oh, is it, and is it, is it coming to something that would be a little bit more widespread, a little bit more accessible to, say, restaurants or hotels? I haven't seen it on the market, uh, let's say, B2C yet. Uh, I've seen it in use in the, in the food industry, but not yet uh, on a consumer. Ah, so there's hope for some of us. That's definitely. Yeah. definitely. <laughs> Maybe the second question is, how do we measure the levels of safety, especially if you're doing this in your own restaurant or if you're like uh, MacGyvering it at home? So, uh, of course, safety, uh, depending on what's the, the focus on, on the safety part, but I would say that we you always have to follow the recommendations of the producer of, uh, of that enzyme. So you will always, when you buy a, a, a bottle or a, a bag of enzymes, you will always have a recommendation of how much to use, at what temperature, for how long. So I would say that's the, mo the most obvious thing is, of course, to, to follow the guidelines from the producer. Would you, would you think that the guidelines would be your base point and then you kind of like mess around with it to see if... You know, to, to create a little bit more of a learning curve? You can definitely tweak, uh, especially temperatures and times, that you can play around with as much as you want. But, for example, if it says that the dosage is a certain amount, you should always follow that. Wonderful. Thank you very much. A hand of applause for John.